Um, and we talked about how they were sweep, uh, cleaning the, the, the roads, etc., and the, the pavements. What else do you remember about how the Germans treated the Jews? Uh, as I said before, uh, a lot was rumours. We didn't know anything for certain mm. except here and there. Uh, the ghettos, I found that out when I had, I had a placement in Poland, which was only just over the border. And I wanted to have something sewn, a dress or a blouse or so. I was told, oh, there's a good uh, dressmaker, such and such an address. So I took myself off to this address. And I came to a wall, a brick wall, and a smallish gate. And I had to go through that gate. And there were, be, beyond the wall, was another little city or you know, village, and there were the Jews, they lived there, and that was my first experience of a ghetto. And I thought, oh my God, uh, how, how is that, you know, how can, how can you lock one part of the population off like that, you know, but... I didn't know at I didn't know at the time that uh, they would be transported later. I mean that we found out much later, after the war. Really, we thought they were just cut off there and had um, uh, very um, oh, what you say, kind of a prison existence. You know, living in a, they couldn't get out couldn't leave without permission and things like that. Did they, going back to that ghetto, did they have guards in the ghetto? Um, what did the Jews look like? Um, and did, could you get any impression of the conditions in the ghetto? No, not really. I mean, that this was the only time that I ever experienced that. And as far as I could see, there, was no, there were no guards. It was just that wall that was built to keep them in. And um, I can't remember if we... Uh, no, I can't remember anything like that. Uh, and as I said, about the, we, we didn't know at the time about um, concentration camps and so on. At least we didn't know. I mean, there were people that knew about it, I'm sure, people that had dealings with certain people, but I didn't. Um, Bruni, um, obviously the Poles that were there would have resisted the Germans. What? How did the Germans react? To the yes, at the time when the German army went into Poland, it was a very, as you know, it was a very short and very successful military um, yes, yes. campaign. Yes. But the Poles didn't take light, uh, kindly to the occupation. We had quite a lot of uh, resistance there, which again, um, it did not come into the open public. You know, things like that were all kept secret, you know, unless you actually uh, came and personally into contact with something like that. Uh, you wouldn't have known about it much, but I knew um, we were rather shocked, well, very much shocked one day. My friend and colleague and I, myself, we had a uh, placement in Poland, running a couple of nurseries, right? And this morning, Irene, which was my friend, she came and she looked very disturbed. I said, whatever's the matter? And she said, oh my God, I've just come across the main, the uh, main um, marketplace of the town. And they were hanging 10 poles in a row. They were hanging them. And I said, oh my God, what? Well, apparently that was the regular uh, revenge for killing a German soldier. Ten civilians per German soldier. 
and that's where the SS would be. Um, you say you're working in a nursery in Poland. Now, obviously, that was for German people, so um, that implies they must have moved Polish people out to move the German people in. Um, can you tell us something about that? Uh, well, yes, of course. I don't know about actually what Poles they would have moved out, but they certainly moved Germans in. Mm. There was a whole... Uh, you see, it was all taken over. The uh, bureaucrats and the military moved in, and... Um, yes, a lot of Ger Germans. And then, of course, I wasn't very far into Poland. It was not far over the border. And there would have been, there would have been Germans probably living there anyway, but mm. there would be added to them, mm. because the, the whole um, idea was to take over the country and mm. assimilate it. Lebensraum. Yeah, yeah. Lebensraum, yes. Lebensraum. Yeah. Um, Bernie, when you moved into Poland, did you go eastwards? Because where East Prussia is, you've got Poland to the east of it, Poland to the west of it and you had Poland to the south of you. So do you go eastward, westwards or southwards? We went southwards. Um, not westwards, because that would have been the corridor. No, we didn't go there. We went southwards, more towards uh, Warsaw, but not as far as Warsaw, there. But we went only for uh, placements, you know, for right. four weeks at a time. And then another four weeks we went to Lithuania, Riga right. as well. Riga, right. Yeah. Mm. Um, Bruni, where you were in East Prussia, you are likely to have had a, a bombing experience. But so how did you experience the war? In, how, what, what, in what ways did you know the war was going on? Well, first of all, in '41, we knew that a big attack would come into Russia because uh, East Prussia was filled with soldiers. We had soldiers everywhere. They were sta uh, um, billeted in every village and every house and so on. So we knew that a big drive would come to Russia, which my parents said, oh my God, that's the end of it. They didn't think that would go well. But we were, we didn't think about it much. Uh, then, we heard about the front in Russia, of course, but we didn't have any bombing as such. We weren't, um, we weren't touched by, much by the war. And also being in mainly agricultural area, we had enough to eat, even if the Russians were short, we still had enough to eat and so on. We did get a lot of refugees sent from Westphalia, where they had a lot of bomb, bombing raids. We had mothers and children, thousands of them sent to um, the relative safety of East Prussia. We didn't get any bombing raids because the Allies, uh, we were out of their range. They, could, they couldn't fly that far. And the Russians had hardly any planes to speak of. Uh, you didn't have to worry about the Russian. Mm. Uh, um, so eventually, in 1944, the war has turned. Uh, the Russians um, have got the Germans in retreat, and the Russians are coming closer and closer towards you. What was that like? Well, that was... Um, the war really came to our doors then, and that was rather frightening. I remember we were sitting in, we were, my friend and I, we were then, uh, we had transferred to a place near the Polish border in a very picturesque area of East Prussia. It was Mazurn and it was a land of lakes and forests. It was beautiful. And that autumn, we once sat on a, by a lake and we could hear the cannons, the noise of the, the um, guns, we could hear them in the distance because the Russian front had broken down as far as the Germans were concerned and the <coughs> Russians were in um, 
and they were coming nearer and nearer and that time they were near the border of East Prussia but which north towards from us and we could hear the guns then. They were held up for another few months afterwards but we were rather well, we thought, oh my God, we had this feeling that the life as we knew it would probably be ended, ending soon, which was not far off the truth. But we had a bit of a pause yet for another couple of months until after Christmas when it really uh, started. 1945 now, yeah. uh, and that must have been so frightening the fact that you knew the Russians were coming closer and closer to you. I mean, would yeah. imagine you'd had loads more refugees coming. Yes, definitely. We had, uh, by uh, after Christmas, we started to have tricks of refugees coming through our town. Uh, our uh, two nurseries were closed and we went and worked in a big hotel and we started to cook enormous pots of soup and things for the refugees. This was organized for the, our social services, you could say. And um, because we were near the border, and of course there were Germans living over the border in previous Poland, so we had these tracks of refugees coming for quite a few weeks and we knew that the uh, Russian front was not very far away. In fact, it wasn't so much of a front anymore. It was rather fluid and mm. uh, broken down, yes, you know? Mm. And it was frightening. And then, with, along with the refugees, there started to come military convoys, right. German military convoys. And they would say, come with us, girls, come with us, uh, girls, we'll take you. You don't want to stay here. And I would have been quite willing to go a few times, but my friend said, we can't do that. We would be um, deserters. Mm. Mm. And they shoot deserters, which they did. They shot deserters later on. And um, so we didn't, and we, were, we cooked and looked after the refugees there for a couple of weeks and they got more and more, and this German army, they, first it was motorized units that came westwards, and then it started to be um, infantry, and when, it, when the infantry started to come, we thought, oh my God, it's getting a bit mm. too worrying. Mm. So um, we were waiting for the, the order to come and uh, that the town should be vacated, mm. yeah? Mm. So um, one day, one evening, we heard, yes, the order had come, the town was to be vacated we could all flee. By then there was no official transport anymore, there was no trains or anything like that, you had to make your own way. And of course this was the end of January, it was bitterly cold, we had a lot of snow on the ro roads, but this was the normal winter in East Prussia, we had cold winters. And um, so when this order came that the town was to be vacated, we said, all right, we'll go to our office, to our county office and see what, what they have arranged for us. Perhaps they put some transport up for us. So we took ourselves off and came to the office and there the windows were open, the doors were open, papers were full blowing in the wind, the drawers were all open, there was not a soul there. And I said to my friend, I said, there you are, you see, now who is the deserter? Yes, you've been so, deserted. Yes, we were deserted. They had long left. They probably had a nice lorry for themselves. 
So we had to go back to our house where we lived and um, we then stood on the road and waited for some soldiers to come by, hopefully, that would take us with them. Uh, because it was only the military that had vehicles. Nobody else had any vehicles, really, not that I knew of. So we stood there on the road for a while, along with our big trunk, packed with all our goods, and um, until a, one lorry did come by, a wagon, and we waved to them and said, Oh, will you take us? Will you take us? And they said, uh, yeah, okay, pile on to the back of the wagon there, where they already had a lot of women and children. And our big trunk, oh, no, you can't bring that. <laughs> There's no room for that. So we had to leave that trunk on the road yeah. and just take a bag each in hand, and that's it. And off we went. So that was the first the start of our journey. Where did you get taken to? We were taken to a, a neighbouring a few miles up the road, I don't know how far, and there was a big camp for refugees, a traditional refugee camp, and that's where they unloaded us all, fra uh, the women and children and us. And as we get, came into the camp, we actually knew that the, the woman, you know, a woman, a doctor it was, that was running the camp, and we knew her, so we greeted her, her with big relief and so on, and and um, she said, well, uh, I'll send you off when I can, tomorrow perhaps, or so when the next transport goes further. You are two young women, I'm not supposed to. This is only for fra uh, for women and children. Yeah. And we were two young women, we weren't really entitled. But she said, I'll get you onto a lorry, lorry then when the next one leaves. And she was as good as her word. Next morning, she put us, told us to get in down to the bottom of the lorry and then the women and children were piling on afterwards and we could go with them. So we drove then to the next stop. Oh, and this was a lo lorry that was fired by wood, a wood burn. Right. It was yeah. powered by wood. Yeah. We had that to, uh, at the end of the war because petrol was getting very scarce altogether, very scarce. So we got these lorries that they fired by wood, just like an old. Um, steam, steam train, you yeah. know, and the smoke was coming out of the chimney of the top and it yeah. puffed and <laughs> shuddered. <laughs> and we made it as far as um, uh, another town where my aunt lived. Oh no, before that, I must tell you, before, th before we got there, we came actually quite close to my home village and we were only about three or four miles away from there with where the lorry went but this was towards evening and we had we didn't know i didn't know if my parents would still be there or if the village had been also vacated and also we knew that the Russians were only half a day behind us and it was a very fluid uh, front line anyway. You could never tell for certain where they were. So when we drove through this village that was near my home, I wanted to get off. But I was afraid as well. And my friend, I said, will you come with me? And she said, no, I'm frightened, I wouldn't come. I, I'm not getting off this lorry, I'm staying with them. And I was frightened too. So we didn't. And for quite a long time I felt guilty about that. 
because I didn't know if my parents were still there, my brothers and sisters, and I might have found them. But on the other hand, I would have had quite a long walk of about two miles through the woods, because we had lots of woods in East Prussia. And, um, and it was not until perhaps two weeks later that I found out by chance uh, when I was talking to a wounded soldier and asked him where he had been wounded, he had been wounded in our village. And I said, when was that? And were there still civilians there? And he said, no, the village was empty by then. And we, but we got, uh, the Rus Russians attacked us and so on, and he was wounded. And it was then that I found new that was that day when I would have got out, walked through those woods and would have run right into the Russians. They were there then, because I could uh, got the dates then. So it was uh, very lucky that we didn't get yes. off the lorry that yes, time. Absolutely. I, I can imagine it must have been absolutely horrendous. I can't see how you escaped from the Russians, because you've got the Russians coming towards you, and they're going to move faster than you can. So how did you escape? Well, it was a matter of luck, determination, luck again. Uh, we had, um, like I said, in parts we would get lifts with, with the soldiers, because they would not leave us standing on the road, because we were young and Dare I say, we were pretty young girls. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> and, um, and then also, when, when it got nearer, we went towards the Baltic coast, because we thought, when, if we get to a port on the Baltic, we'll get a boat, and we wanted to get a boat to Danzig, Gdansk, or perhaps even further westwards. And that's, that was our aim. So we went to partly, we walked it sometimes through the snow, because there were always, wherever you were, there were always tracks of refugees. Everybody was trying to make their way westwards. I remember once we were walking um, with with other women and children, and there was this little boy running beside us, and he was crying. He was looking for his mum, and he was perhaps six or seven years old, and he had lost his mother. And we couldn't do anything about it, and we couldn't do anything for him. He ran along with us for a stretch, and then he disappeared again. That little boy, he, he haunted my dreams for years afterwards, you know? Mm. And that yeah. was, was just one. So, uh, <clears throat> yeah. Well, we finally decided our best bet was to keep with the wounded soldiers. With the wounded soldiers, we would make ourselves useful because everything else, all the camps and so on, it was always women and children, women and children only. So we said, if we hold to the wounded, then we have a better chance. So we went to, uh, we came to this town that was right on the half. Now the half is an inlet from the Baltic. To get to the Baltic, uh, proper, you have to cross that half, that inlet, and it was frozen over, that was iced, uh, and the ice was so strong that it held wagons to go across. Mm -hmm. So we went uh, and we came to the town that was on the uh, edge there, and there were wounded you see, there were tracks of wounded soldiers. They would be in little wagons, war-strewn wagons. They would be um, 
There's the gay farm, buckets, you know. Yes, yes, anything that would move. Yes, anything that would move. Yes. And um, on the coast there, we had lots of people that had left their old their refugees. There were lots of wagons abandoned. They would be full of beds and do, like what we call do now. Uh, beds and bed uh, blankets and things, and we would go and take them down and cover the wounded with them because they had very little cover. And um, those abandoned wagons, they were there for anybody to empty if you wanted anything, you just helped yourself. So we did that and we followed the tricks of the wounded which was much better, because then we crossed the ice at night. Now this is quite a, that was quite a journey. It was all, oh, I don't know, perhaps five miles of ice, I would think. Yeah, five miles, maybe. Mm. And um, they had, the, the military had to marked some path to which the um, refugees, the tracks had to keep, you see. And um, there was already, funnily enough, as, as they were dr driving across the ice, when the tracks had to stop for some reason or other, the water, there was water on top of the ice, and then the water would rise on the axles. Mm. And that was rather frightening. Mm. Uh, because we thought, my God, is the ice melting and mm -hmm. breaking in. Uh, we didn't actually see any uh, holes in the ice, any breakages. Uh, it was later, it was a week or two later, when we had a bit of warmer weather and it thawed a bit, then they got uh, breakages and you had wagons disappearing, horses disappearing under mm -hmm. the ice and so on, yeah. But um, anyway, we followed them and we came across, uh, that night we walked across, Irene and I, and we walked across the ice to see what was on the other side and then we walked back to our trek again to keep to these two so We had two soldiers there, that two wounded, uh, that we had made friends with. One was a, one was from Berlin. The Berliner, they were like the Cockneys, you know, the Berliners, right. they were known as for their big mouth. Yes, yes. You know, they were, they could Confident. all. Confident, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah, always. So. And the other one was a very nice young lieutenant, uh, uh, so he had a little bit of rank, and the other one had a big mouth. So we came <laughs> to those two. Because I thought, we thought, aha, yes. a good spot here to hang on to. So when they were, oh yes, when we had gone across the ice and we were all in this one hotel, they were loaded in, and um, that was full of the wounded, and the wounded lay on the floor. Uh, oh, many, many. And the Dr. Military, doctor there in charge, we said, we came along with these two and they said, oh, these are our, our personal nurses, we need them. <laughs> <laughs> and the doctor said, oh no, I'm not having anybody, oh for God's sake, I've just sent all the nurses off because it was getting a bit too dangerous, the Russians were coming a bit too close and so on. And I can't take the responsibility of these two girls. No, no, no. Oh, yes, and they were arguing with him, and we said, oh, let us, we'll help, we'll help. So in the end, we did, he did uh, allow us to go. And we were, we were busy. Poor soldiers, they were lying on the floor, and they were shouting for drinks or for food or for for their mother. And we were on our feet for, oh, I don't know, 24 hours, and we snatched an hour of sleep sometimes on the kitchen tables. And then we said when, and every so often some boats would come to the harbour and take some of the soldiers and take them along the um, 
Baltic as far as Gdansk, which is Gdansk now Danzig, which was a big harbor and a big collective place there. So when our two were loaded up one night into the ambulance, of course, they said, and you are coming with us, and we had the same. The ambulance driver didn't want to take us, but he had to take us, and we got on this yes. boat. And on the boat again, it was just one of those transport boats, and mm. it was just laid out with straw. The, the whole floor was laid out with straw, and the wounded were lying there like mm. that. And we were there, we were 36 hours at this time on our feet, just tending to them as much as we could, mm. you know. And we got to Gdansk, where again we were unloaded into big, um, um, like halls, um, yeah, where goods, you know, where big warehouses. Warehouses. Yes. <laughs> warehouses. Big warehouses. And there again, this was all the wounded. Mm. And there again, we stuck to our two, and we were their personal nurses, and we were, they were told, they were telling everybody, these are our, our nurses, and they come with us, no matter what. Mm. And we've made ourselves useful there again, with mm. taking the Red Cross was there, and we used to take the food out and bandages and things. Mm. Bree, uh, I'm sorry to, to pause at this point, but could you explain why you were frightened of the Russians? What, what, was the, what was the main fear that you had? Well, the Russians, I mean, by then we knew quite a lot about their behaviour because they had already uh, come into the northern part of East Prussia. Uh, my friend Irene's mother was living there. She had been evacuated luckily beforehand to near Berlin. But we knew the stories that came out of that area. Uh, the Russian army were very brutal. First of all, they took the women and raped them and killed them. And, well, they were just terrible, really. Nobody wanted to fall into their hands. So uh, all we knew is to get away. Uh, one example, for instance, my uncle, one of my uncles, we found this out after the war, of course, but he didn't flee. He thought he could stay on his farm, and why should he go? And a uh, little bit of an arrogant he knew what to do. Well, the Russians just came, put him on the barn door and shot him there and then. So and that's how it was, you know. Except for the women, they had to suffer beforehand. So that's why we ran. There was no other way. So there you are in Danzig, but yeah. from my eyes, this is like going from the frying pan into the fire because the Russians now are coming so fast. They're going to go through Danzig into Berlin. We're into ah. a, a March, February, March, yes. April of uh, 1945. This is disastrous times. What happened? True enough, but when we were in Danzig, the ro road was still open to as far as Berlin and further westwards. They hadn't broken through yet. They did soon afterwards and came as far as the Baltic, mm. cut through, but not then. So there were still going trains from Danzig to the west. And um, thank God there was a train where our two were loaded on. It was a, a whole train just with wounded and with personnel, of course, to look after them. And we were on that train again, as personal nurses. <laughs> Thank God. And it was like we could, the train went through, and it went as far as Magdeburg. I remember that. It was evening, and the train came to a halt. 
uh, before we got into Magdeburg and we said, well, what's going on? Are we unloaded, being unloaded here? No, no. And there was a um, bombing raid on Magdeburg and we saw that and we saw the sky full of fire, you know, red, all mm. you could see, it was just red. And to us it was just terrible, it was like looking into the gates of hell, because we had never seen a bombing raid like that before. So we stayed in that train for several hours, and then after a while we could travel on. And we traveled on some more miles westward, and we came to this beautiful town in the Harz Mountains, which is not far from Braunschweig or Hanover, if you looked mm. at the map. And a beautiful town nestling in the mountains, a spa. Every second house a beautiful hotel. And that's where they were unloaded, mm. our two friends. And that's where we got off as well then. So, uh, and th this town was completely untouched by the, by the war. It was just as beautiful as it ever had been from the 17th, 18th century, you know, very picturesque. And uh, the, all these hotels were t turned into uh, mm, hospitals mm. for the wounded. So, and tr so that's where we finished. We were all right then. We could go to our council offices there, our relevant council offices, and we could go and get ourselves some clothes because we had only the clothes we stood up in. We had lived in those clothes now for mm. four weeks or so, yes. you know. We, were, um, we weren't very um, nice. Mm. We had... Uh, very itchy mm -hmm. bodies and God yes. knows what. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It was terrible. So we had to go to this um, um, bath place where we had big showers and got this, the different things to rub onto your mm. body and so on. And had your hair done and everything. So, And then we went and looked for some accommodation. So there you are, Bruni, in, if I get the pronunciation right, Bat Hartsburg. Um, yeah. Did you find somewhere to stay? Yes, yes, we went to, uh, we found this very nice house with an old lady that uh, owned it and she was happy to take us in because she had plenty of room and so on. She said yes. Um, so we moved in there and we wanted to see how the war was going on because by then of course um, the Allied had across the Rhine, I think, by then. It was the end of February. Well, maybe not. But anyway, we wanted to know how the war was going on. And we were asked her if we can put the radio on and uh, listen to the news and so on. Oh, no, she was very reluctant. Uh, she, um, she wanted to keep the radio. Um, I, she, I think she thought it would be used up if you put it on too much, you know, whatever, however she figured it out. But she wanted to keep the radio going for the victory news. The victory news, the German victory news. Well, I, I, Irene and I were just looking at each other and shook our heads and thought, well, what can you say, what mm. can you say? What happened next to you, Irene, and the two soldiers? Well, we kept visiting them, of course. They were in two different hospitals, if I remember right. And the one, the Berliner, he was soon uh, discharged. His uh, injuries were not so severe. And he actually, he wanted me to go with him to Berlin, but I re declined because by then, the Russian army was not far from Berlin, and I thought, Ma no way am I going anywhere near there. So he went on his own, we never heard from him again. And the other, uh, uh, Hans, he was from Cologne, if I remember right. Uh, he was more severely injured. 
he was transferred to another hospital when the British came in, so I lost touch with him. So they were all right. Mm. So if I gathered right, what you're fortunate in, in having happened to you is that the area you were in would, would have been liberated by the British and the Americans um, rather than the Russians. Um, what happened when the British and the Americans came? Uh, well, yes, certainly that was the area. We would have packed our bags because we, um, before the Americans came, there was a rumor going around that the Russians, they, they might make the border, there was going to be the border between East and West Germany, you know, the, and uh, there was a rumor going around that but Hartburg was uh, possibly going to be in the East sector. So Irene and I was practically packing again. We said, well, nowhere will we stay here. But then in the end, the border was only about five, eight miles mm. from us uh, to the East, so we stayed anyway. What, brilliant, what happened then when the British and Americans came? What, what, um, did you see them? What happened to you? Well, that was very interesting, actually. No, the Americans came right. first. Uh, but Hasburg was declared an open city, open town, because it was, like I said, every hotel was a hospital. It was just open. And so they just rolled in one day, the Americans. And we were amazed, the Americans. They all, uh, it was a kind of a, um, tanks. They had right. a lot of tanks, Panzer Regiment or yes, something like um, that. Sherman tanks, I think, the yeah. American tanks. Yes. And they seemed to be all six foot tall or more, <laughs> and they all wore very nice uniforms, very good cloth, mm. and they looked well fed. Yes. And we said, oh, look at them, they're all right. And they sat in the tanks and uh, had their legs dangling from the windows and shouting and whistling and throwing cigarettes around at chocolate bars. Children were all running around to them. So they, they, it was quite an experience with the <laughs> Americans. <laughs> Uh, they didn't stay very long, and then the British came, because it was going to be a British uh, yeah. zone, yeah. yes. The Americans were going further south. And uh, the British were more like the German army, uh, you know. In terms of what they were wearing. Yes, <laughs> in terms of what they were wearing, their stature yeah. and yeah. everything. But they were very nice too. No, no, nothing happened to us, because uh, the, the German wounded, they were all transferred more or less to a different town, to their hospitals over there. The British then uh, took over uh, the town more or less and turned it into a holiday camp for the British troops, a short term uh, leave centre because of all the beds that I had in the hotels and B&Bs. Mm. And um, they made it for the British troops a short time. They, they would come for four days right. for a short leave because they couldn't send the war to England. That would have been too yes. expensive. So this was very nice and it was already made. The hotels and in, t in the park, in the city, we had a big... Um, uh, Kua house, we called it. It was like a big, um, what would you call it, where the where the troops came for their meals, and where at the e in the evening there were dances, dances held, mm. dances, beer right. gardens, yes, all yeah. that kind mm. of thing, you know. Mm. And since we were very hungry at the time, the rations were very short. Food was very scarce. And as soon as we heard the British were going to take this over, I said, right, I'm going to work for the British. At least we'll get something to eat there. <laughs> <laughs> Which I did. Could you speak English at that point, or did you learn the English later? I didn't speak much English, very little. But as soon as I decided I'd go and work for the British, 
I got some lessons, though. There were plenty of people that would teach English, you know. So I uh, booked some lessons there, and then working with the British every day, you learned it. And uh, so that's, that was very good. And like I said, we got plenty to eat, thank goodness. I, I got um, familiar with Welsh ray beet, <laughs> which I thought was fantastic. Yes. And then everything else, I mean, we got food and we could eat and drink as well. Funny, Bruni, you, you met your husband uh, while you were there, didn't you? Can you tell us about that? Just yes, well, my husband, he was in the RAF. He was Irish, but he volunteered in 42 or 3, something like that. And um, he was in charge of the officers' nightclub. Right. And he had a, a gift shop as well. He ran a gift shop <laughs> for the troops. And also he was in charge of a hotel for the RAF members that would come there. So um, he was on the staff, obviously. And we were in... The troops would come for four days and we would see them off in the, uh, on the fourth day with breakfast and so on. And then everything would be cleaned and sorted out. And in the evening there would be dances mm. for the staff. Right. And I met him there. I met him actually, first of all, on the ski lift, the ski runs. Right. Because we were, we were skiing there right. as well in the winter. I met him there and then uh, we used to go to dances and that's how it kind of started. And then finally, and he was known as Paddy. In those days and there, we saw the British Army the whole lot of them only had, they all went by four names only. Paddy, Jock, Taffy and Tommy. <laughs> <laughs> because that's all we heard. Right. And my husband's name was Paddy. Right. And when we finally, uh, when we married two years later here in England, in Birmingham, people in Germany were a little bit taken aback that I went to England to marry Paddy, but I finished up marrying Jim. <laughs> <laughs> Bruni, I, I can't tell you how much I've, really, I, I've enjoyed this. This has been an absolute privilege and honour to listen to you speak, and I've, I've loved the story. I can see you crossing the ice and everything, so thank you so much for coming in. <laughs> thank, thank you. you. <laughs>